In the first week of this MOOC, we have introduced you to the resource challenge as the reason for this transformation towards a circular economy. Now, in this last week, I would like to come back to that. We have ad identified three potential problems to solve and now we can draw some conclusions on whether or not these options to close cycles actually make a difference. The three issues are, you'll remember, availability of resources, waste generation and greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts. The four options for closing cycles we discussed in this course are reuse, repair, remanufacturing and recycling. How do they score on our three criteria? First, reuse. As we have seen, the meaning of reuse is quite vague. It refers to actually using again a product that has been discarded, like an empty bottle that can be taken back to the shop and can then be used again by the producer of the drink that was contained in it. Each bottle that is reused means one new bottle that does not need to be produced. This certainly saves resources and it avoids waste. However, there are some trade-offs. The empty bottle needs to be transported, which takes energy, and it must be cleaned, for which hot water and cleaning agents are used. Transport and cleaning also requires resources and this leads again to greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts. Overall, however, reuse in such a manner is often a much better option. Another strategy that is often included in the concept of reuse is a more intensive use of the product by sharing it, renting it, etc. instead of owning it. Our recurring case study of the bicycle is a good example of this. And another good example is the equipment rental system, as it allows products such as drills or chainsaws to be used more intensively if people rent them instead of buy them. Is this better? Overall, once again, I think it is. It means getting more service out of the same product. One could speculate that less intensively used equipment ages more slowly and can have a longer lifespan. This is true, to some extent, but even a product that is not used at all still ages and is likely to be discarded. Then, repair. Repair aims at keeping a product in use for a longer time. The advantage would be that the frequency of buying a new product can be reduced. This, once again, saves resources and avoids waste. Does it also help the environment? Well, in some cases it obviously does. How frustrating is it to go to the shop with your electronic and be told that you should buy a new one as having it repaired would be more expensive. This happens even when there is nothing much wrong with it and it could still last for years if a small component of it was repaired. There is a trade-off, however. For some products, technological development goes so fast that the energy efficiency of new products improves significantly over a short period of time. To keep the old products in use for a longer time could therefore lead to a higher overall energy use and therefore also higher CO2 emissions. Refrigerators are an example in which from the point of view of energy it's better to replace an old fridge with a new one every decade or so. For other products lifespan extension is perfect, especially those products that don't use energy during their use phase. Furniture would be a good example of this. Next Remanufacturing. This too is a strategy for lengthening the lifespan of the product or its components. However, in this case the product is not just kept in use, but it is remanufactured to modern standards of operation. The risks mentioned above when keeping an old, not up to standard product in use is therefore much less. 
On the other hand, remanufacturing is much more demanding than repair. It can really only be done by the manufacturer and not by private individuals, however handy they, they might be, or by repair shops. Most probably, also the ownership will change. Remanufactured products will not get back to the original user, but will be part of a larger supply scheme. For companies, moving from product to service delivery is a prerequisite for a successful remanufacturing chain. And also, this cycle seems to be especially relevant for expensive, long-lasting, not very fashion-sensitive products, such as medical apparatus or agricultural equipment. With regard to our three focus issues, like in the case of repair and reuse, remanufacturing basically extends the lifespan of the product. This means we need less raw materials and generate less waste per unit of function. Again, it is not so straightforward how this will benefit the environment. Of course, less raw materials will also reduce the environmental impacts related to their production. On the other hand, managing all the flows of products to be remanufactured involves a lot of transport, often over long distances. And as we all know, transport has environmental impacts of its own. So it would depend on the infrastructure, on the distances, on the modes of transport, etc. to work out the extent of the environmental benefits of remanufacturing. In all probability, there is indeed an environmental improvement to be expected, also for remanufacturing. Finally, recycling. This is different from all the others. It refers to materials, not to products. In the butterfly diagram of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, it is the outer cycle and therefore the least preferred. But I'm not so sure if this is indeed the case. And for sure, almost every product ends up at the recycling stage finally, even if it has been used many times in many circles before that happens. It is the only cycle that keeps the materials in use beyond the lifespan of products. And if we really want to keep resources in use, it is perhaps the most essential cycle. It may also be the most difficult one to get right. It depends very much on the type of material that we are talking about. Recycling of metals, of plastics, of construction minerals are all very different stories. Metals as elements are ideal candidates for recycling. It saves resources, it avoids waste and it reduces energy use all at the same time. Difficulties can be expected in the case of complex materials where many elements are combined. Difficulties can also be expected in cases of very low concentrations. Think, for example, of a complex electronic product, such as a mobile phone. As its components become increasingly smaller, the amount of work needed to extract a very small amount of each material becomes greater, which implies the final energy benefits will be lower, or even absent. But for large-scale, high-concentration applications of metals, it's perfect. If you have hundreds of thousands of identical phones, which can be broken down in an automated process, this will surely improve the benefits of recycling them. For plastics, recycling is fraught with difficulties. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to separate waste streams from the different types of plastics. And there's also a risk that plastics contain hazardous and sometimes even forbidden substances, which we don't want to come out on the market again. This means recycled plastics are generally of a low quality and have limited usefulness. Also, it usually takes more energy than it saves to set up the collection system. For plastics, incineration may not be such a bad option after all. It prevents the plastic waste from entering the environment, which is the main concern for that type of material. And plastics can be used as a high-quality fuel, thus reducing the need for fresh fossil fuels. Construction materials are yet another story, because we are generally talking about huge volumes. 
Recycling technologies are being developed with some success, but transport remains a large issue. Interesting options are being explored at the moment for concrete recycling on-site, so transport can be avoided. This would indeed reduce problems with resource availability, with waste generation and with environmental impacts. In summary, there are a few conclusions to be drawn. First, the different re-options have different applicability and different benefits from the point of view of the resource challenge. We have to choose wisely and see which re-option or combination of them is best for which products. This will differ depending on the product's characteristics. Each option must be assessed and its consequences understood before embracing it. Second, we have seen that product design is very important. It is essential to anticipate already in the product design stage on what needs to happen at the end of the product service life. We can define, as we have seen in the course, sensible rules for design for R that can really make a difference. Third, we have seen that many changes are needed in society to make this transition happen. Product and material design is only the start. Fourth and last, we can conclude that the re-options are generally effective in reducing waste and reducing the need for new raw materials. However, we should not forget the environmental dimension. A circular economy does not necessarily save energy, nor does it automatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and others. But it can lead to new business models, design strategies and manufacturing processes which are more resource and energy friendly. This should be an explicit point of attention in all cases. Only then will a circular economy be a real solution to the resource challenge.